Well, good morning and welcome to New Life Fremont. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here and it's good to be with you this morning for worship. If you're watching live, take a second to say hello and greet one another in the YouTube live chat. We want to see who all we're worshiping with this morning. And that includes kids. Uh, if you're watching right now, ask your parents if you can say something or if you can send some emojis in the chat as well. And if you're new, I want to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, we're really glad that you've chosen to join us this morning. In the description of this YouTube video, there is a link to our connection sheet. And that's just a good way for you to let us know you're here, pass along any contact info that you feel comfortable sharing, ask us questions, and uh, hopefully we can follow up with you soon, uh, probably later this week, and help you get better connected in our church. But with that said, let's go ahead and begin our worship service with our time of calling. The TV show The Crown on Netflix uh, follows the reign of the current Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II. And she became queen after her father, who was king, passed away when he was only 56. And Elizabeth was 26 when he passed away and she became queen, which was much younger than most expect someone to become king or queen. And in the TV show, there's this powerful scene early on in the days after her father has passed away as they're scrambling to figure out uh, what details they need to take care of next. And Elizabeth is still a little bit shocked and still mourning her father's death, but her, her assistant comes to her and sits with Elizabeth and her husband and uh, starts to iron out some details. And her assistant asks her if she's chosen her name yet. And Elizabeth is confused by that question. And she says, my name? And the man clarifies, yes, ma'am, your Reginald name. That is the name that you will take as queen. Your father took George, but obviously his name is Albert. And before he abdicated, your uncle took Edward, but his name is David. So Elizabeth asks, what's wrong with my name? And her husband puts his hand on her knee and assures her, nothing is wrong with your name. And so Elizabeth says, well then, let's not overcomplicate matters unnecessarily. My name is Elizabeth. And she gets up to leave the room and immediately her assistant stands up and says, long live Queen Elizabeth. The first time anyone has ever said that to her. You see, something that this scene is highlighting is that Elizabeth doesn't yet realize that the queen and Elizabeth are really two different people. You know, she thinks that a simple solution to choosing a name is to just keep the same name. I was Elizabeth before I put on the crown. I'll just stay Elizabeth after I put on the crown. But she's being naive. She's never going to be just Elizabeth anymore. She's the queen. She wears the crown. And wearing the crown is a burden. Because people expect the person who wears the crown to be magnificent, majestic, perfect. You know, all the pageantry that surrounds the queen keeps up the facade of her perfection. But the reality is that the person who wears the crown is not actually magnificent or majestic or perfect. They're an imperfect person. And that's why Winston Churchill, when he's advising Elizabeth, says, Never let them see the real Elizabeth Windsor. Never let them see that carrying the crown is often a burden. He says this because people need to believe that the queen is perfect and unburdened by the crown, even though she's really not. No human queen or king is. But our king, God himself, the king of kings, is actually perfect and unburdened by the crown. There aren't two versions of him, the facade and the reality. There's only one version of our king, perfect in majesty, truly deserving all glory, all honor, all praise, truly deserving to wear the crown. 
And so at this time, I invite you to hear and respond to this call to worship, which comes from Psalm 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, in your love for the human race, you sent your Son, the King of Kings, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself human nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. In your mercy, grant us the power to walk in the way of his suffering and also to share in his majesty. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Continue worship now with our time of cleansing. In the movie Tenet, uh, the movie opens up with the main character working an operation where he is ultimately captured and tortured by some mercenaries who want to know who he is working with. But instead of breaking and betraying his team, he takes a cyanide pill, which he and his team had been provided for situations just like this. But the cyanide pill, or whatever it was, doesn't kill him. And he wakes up and is informed by a man that it was a test. It was a test of his loyalty and he passed. Now they know that he is willing to die before giving up his team. And so the man says to him, We all believe that we would run into the burning building. But until we feel that heat, we can never no, but you do. You chose to die instead of giving up your colleagues. That test that you passed, not everybody does. Throughout scripture, there are several stories of people facing tests, facing trials. Adam and Eve are told by God not to eat of the fruit, and Abraham is told by God to offer his only son Isaac as a sacrifice. Moses and the Israelites are led by God to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And each of these trials is meant to test their loyalty, to test their faith, to test what's truly in their hearts. We all believe that we know what's in our hearts, but until we're tested, we can't know for sure. And so sometimes... God provides trials. He provides tests so that we can know what's truly in our hearts. That could be a difficulty at work or conflict within your family or even a situation where you might be tempted to disobey God and his word. But instead of begrudging these trials, instead of complaining about these tests, we should embrace them. Yes, they're difficult. That's the nature of a trial, but they're for our good. They humble us. They help us to see ourselves more accurately. They show us who or what we run to when times get tough. Will we run to God or run to something else? And if you persevere through a trial, if you press on when you're being tested, God promises that you will come through on the other side stronger and more steadfast. Faith in God is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. And so the next time that you're tested, the next time you face a trial, know that God is giving you a tremendous opportunity to see what's really in your heart. He's giving you a chance to respond in faith to him, to trust in him, and to grow. And so hear now the law of God, which comes from James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let's pray this prayer of confession together. O Lord, receive us in repentance. Leave us not, but save us from temptation. Grant us pure thoughts. Grant us tears of repentance, remembrance of death, and a sense of peace. Grant us mindfulness to confess our sins. Grant us humility, charity, and obedience. Implant in us the root of all blessings, the fear of you in our hearts. Grant that we may love you with all our heart and soul and obey you in all things. 
Shield us from evil people and devils and passions and all lawless matters. May your will be fulfilled in us, for you are blessed forevermore. Amen. Please use this time for silent confession. Father in heaven, we confess that we often scorn trials and tests. We begrudge their inconvenience. We pity ourselves in the midst of them. We wonder why you would let them happen to us. Yet, Father, we know that you test us and try us for our good. You use these tests to humble us, to form us into your image, to produce steadfastness in us. So we ask you, Lord, for grace and mercy to endure trials and tests, and even, Lord, to count them as joy, because true joy is found in your presence and by walking in your ways. Bring these things about in us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Listen now to the reading of the gospel, which comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus has resisted every temptation. He's passed every trial and every test so that you can know for sure that if you've trusted in him for the forgiveness of sins, you will be saved. Even in moments when we are faithless, he remains faithful. Amen. My name is Matt. I'm Ezra. I'm Rachel. And I'm Anya. <laughs> if it's your first time with us, welcome to New Life. Please click the link below in the description to fill out a connection fee- sheet. Let us know uh, that you were here. Um, to keep up to date on all New Life happenings, please uh, register for our newsletter at newlifefremont.org and also subscribe to this YouTube channel. So for our first announcement, we have a new adult Sunday school starting, Discipleship 201, um, Living with Vision. It will be starting March 7th, Sunday at 
8.30 a.m. on Zoom. If and when we start meeting for in-person worship, the time and location could change a bit. In this study, we're going to use Tim Geller's book, Center Church, to give us a theological uh, vision for living as Christians in the 21st century. For this study, we will be using broad strokes to study the book while combining scripture as well. And you don't need to read the book to join a study. Just register for the 12-week study um, through our newsletter at newliferemont.org. Second, we have youth group. For the next couple of months, youth group will be studying knowing the God who is. We'll be tackling questions like, is, does God exist? Is being a Christian worth it? What is God like? Our next two meetings will be on March 7th, March 14th, all at 4 p.m. Oh, um, my turn? Okay. If you or your student have mm -hmm. already been involved in youth group, Pastor Dave will reach out to you with details. If you're a student, if you are a student or have a student who wants to be involved with youth group for the first time, Pastor Dave, um, email Pastor Dave at rev.dave.lee at gmail.com. Well, that's all, folks. Have a great week. Thanks. Good morning. Welcome again to New Life Fremont. My name is Dave. I'm the other pastor here at New Life. Uh, pastor Kevin, who's been leading us to the liturgy, actually recorded the liturgy earlier this week before welcoming his daughter into the world. And so congratulations to Pastor Kevin and Holly. Uh, we are so thrilled and excited for you. Uh, what that means for us as a church is that Pastor Kevin is going to be away on paternity leave for the next several weeks. And so if there's anything that you need, uh, please reach out to me. I would love to be here for you, to support you in any way that I can. If you have questions about our church, you'd like prayer, you just would like to meet with the pastor, reach out to me. I would love to connect with you. We are continuing our sermon series today called Standing Fast in True Grace. Uh, we don't know what the future holds. Uh, and uh, if 2020 taught us anything, it taught us that it, we don't know what the future holds, but what we do know is that we could stand fast in true grace no matter what happens. And so today we're continuing the book of First Peter. We're in chapter 2. We're looking at verses 18 through 25. And last Sunday we looked at a challenging part of First Peter where he teaches us about the value of service in the Christian life. And today, we're going to continue to learn another aspect of service, serving in our careers, in our vocations, in our work lives. And it's going to be uncomfortable at points because uh, we all know how challenging work can be. All of us, one time or another, end up working for a bad boss. So how do you process that? How do you deal with that as a Christian? What difference does the gospel make? We're going to be looking at that today. And so if you can open your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, this is the reading of God's Word. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly, what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure, but when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile on return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself uh, to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, this has been such a challenging time to work in so many different ways. And uh, some of us, Lord, uh, don't have enough work to do. Uh, and uh, it's, it's been a challenge to 
to have peace in our work lives. Uh, some of us have had our responsibilities pile up and it feels like there's been no rest and work has been uh, more intense than ever, even though it seems like the world is quieter than ever and uh, we're feeling exhausted and Lord, some of us are thinking about leaving our jobs. Uh, some of us are barely holding on in our careers, maybe thinking about changing our careers. Work is so hard, it's so complicated. And God, we pray that uh, wherever we are, um, you would meet us here, that you would encourage us, that you would show us, Lord, that our identity is ultimately not found in our work, but in Jesus. And so Lord, speak to us here today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Back in 2007, Erin Callen was the most powerful woman in Wall Street. At the age of 41, she had just been appointed the chief financial officer of Lehman Brothers. Uh, it was 2007, not the best time to take a position like that because it was right on the precipice of the Great Recession, the financial collapse of 2008. And so in a matter of six months, she resigned from her position as she looked at the imminent end of her, her firm. Uh, three months later, her firm, Lehman Brothers, closed and no longer existed. And by December of 2008, Erin uh, Callen attempted to take her own life, and thankfully, she was unsuccessful. In her memoir, she looks back on all the years that she spent at Lehman Brothers and she writes this. Uh, she, she thinks, she, she, she says, uh, I was a case study in letting your career dominate your life and it wasn't a pretty picture. Erin Callen is proof that you don't need to have a bad boss to have a bad boss. Uh, we dream in America about being our own boss. We want to be able to call our own shots. Uh, but the secret to having a fulfilling career is not to become your own boss. According to the Bible, the secret to having a full career is learning how to serve. Today's passage, Peter tells slaves how to become better servants. And that sounds really bad until you realize that Peter is actually using slaves as a model of Christian vocation. He's actually telling us that the vocation of a slave, the vocation to serve, should be the attitude of every Christian in the way that we approach all our work. And when you understand that and embrace it and live it, it can be incredibly liberating. So let's break down this passage today by looking at three things. Number one, we're going to we're going to look at how grace is empowering. Number two, we're going to look at how suffering is a calling. And number three, we're going to look at how Jesus is trustworthy. Let's start with our first point. Grace is empowering. Today's passage starts with the word servant, which actually in the New Testament Greek means slaves. It's jarring for he, us to hear Peter tell slaves that they should be better servants, that they should be subject to their masters. It sounds like Peter is endorsing slavery. Uh, we want to hear him condemn slavery. Uh, it sounds like Peter's telling slaves to accept their station in life, to grin it and grit it. But if you look closely here, you'll see that he was actually saying the opposite. He was actually empowering these slaves. Just about every important writer in the ancient world wrote about slavery. Uh, they wrote about the importance of slaves knowing their place in society. This was very important to people in the ancient world. Plato, Aristotle, Seneca, every serious thinker of the ancient world wrote about a slave's station in life. Plato wrote about the authority of a master over his slaves. Aristotle wrote that slaves were incapable of thinking for themselves, and so they needed to be led by their masters. Slaves actually needed their masters. Notice that no one ever 
actually addressed slaves. Every ancient writer wrote to masters to tell them how to teach their slaves what their position in life was. No one actually wrote directly to slaves. In fact, Aristotle thought that slaves were too unintelligent to, to be told anything or taught anything. The fact that Peter wrote directly to slaves in the New Testament was revolutionary. Unlike most people in the ancient world, Peter saw slaves as intelligent people whose feelings and opinions mattered. And he, he saw slaves as people who were capable of thinking for themselves. And so he, when, when Peter spoke directly to slaves, he was saying, you have a choice. Your slavery doesn't define you. Uh, you're, 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 you may be enslaved on the outside, but you are still free on the inside. You're free to think and feel and act in ways that are consistent with your beliefs and your values. Your masters can't rule your heart. And this kind of writing, this kind of tone would have made any slave master nervous. The fact that Peter wrote directly to slaves also meant that there were slaves present in the churches where his letter was being read. One of the most radical things about the early church was the way that Christians worshipped next to slaves, that citizens worshipped next to slaves. Mixing, sla mixing uh, slaves and citizens outside of work was considered taboo in the ancient world. Most people considered slaves to be subhuman. Uh, the church was different though. In the church, everyone was equally redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Everyone was captive to God's grace. Christians are subject to all. And so in the church, a master could easily be in a position where he would actually be serving his slave. Uh, this was countercultural and revolutionary. Then in, a un then in yet another unexpected twist, Peter goes on to say, be subject to your masters. Peter took the worst part of a slave's life, service, and turned it into a blessing. He's saying, don't serve because you have to serve. Serve because you are free to serve. You are free because your true master is not your slave master. Your true master is God. That's why Peter tells these slaves to be subject to your masters with all respect. The New Testament Greek word for respect there actually means fear. It's the same word for fear that we saw last week when Peter told all Christians to fear God. Honor the emperor, but fear God. Remember, fear is reserved for God alone. We honor everyone. We honor even the emperor, but God is the only one that we fear. We all struggle with fear in our work. We fear that we're not doing well enough in our work, that we're not good enough in our, at our work. I know that I fear often that I am not a good enough pastor. Uh, maybe you feel fear that you're not a good enough parent. Uh, maybe you fear that you're not a, a good enough engineer or a good enough teacher. We all fear that we're not doing well enough. Uh, we all struggle with fear in our jobs. Remember Erin Callahan the CEO of Lehman Brothers. Well, listen to how she describes her journey at Le Lehman Brothers. She writes, I didn't start out with the goal of devoting all of myself to my job. It crept in over time. First, I spent half an hour on Sunday organizing my email, to-do list, and calendar to make Monday morning easier. Then I was working a few hours on Sunday, then all day. My boundaries slipped away until uh, work was all that was left. Inevitably, when I left my job, it devastated me. I couldn't just move on. I did not know how to value who I was versus what I did. What I did was who I was. Now, none of us are slaves. It's an insult to slavery to compare our jobs to slavery. But fear will drive you to work like a slave. Fear will make you feel worthless if you fail. Fear will distort your perspective and allow work to take over your entire life. 
we need to find a way to stand up to our fears when it comes to our careers. We need to find a way to fear God instead of fearing our careers, fearing our bosses, our clients, our customers, our families. Sometimes our bosses can be scary. And so how do we stop fearing our jobs and start fearing God, especially when you have a bad boss? when you have a boss who is unjust and unfair and maybe even borderline abusive, when you have a toxic boss, how do you get over your fears? Well, it starts with learning to suffer well. This brings to our second point. Suffering is a calling. Peter says that every Christian is called to suffer well. Look at verse 21. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Jesus gave us an example to follow. The New Testament Greek word for example here actually means under letter, which is a kind of worksheet that people used in the ancient world to teach children how to write out the Greek alphabet. It's really similar to the alphabet worksheets that our children use in preschool and kindergarten today. Uh, you would get give children this worksheet with letters and children would trace the letters to learn how to write, to learn how to write these different letters. And they would go one by one, uh, one letter in the alphabet after and another. The suffering of Jesus, his life, his pattern of suffering, his example of suffering is like a worksheet, a stencil, or a pattern that God has given us to follow and to trace with our lives. We need to trace our lives against the pattern of Christ's life. That's the calling that is God that God has given to every single Christian. And so when you have a bad boss, um, bad bosses are like homework that teaches us how to suffer well. Now, before we move on, I need to emphasize that the Bible is not telling Christians to voluntarily accept abuse. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21, Paul says to slaves, if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, Jesus says, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. In other words, the Bible's telling us when it's possible to flee suffering, flee, get out of there. Don't look for suffering. Uh, get, avoid suffering whenever possible. But sometimes you can't avoid suffering. Sometimes you can't avoid an, a bad boss. You can't avoid injustice. And in those times, we can learn to suffer well. Peter is saying the most fundamental thing that we need to learn how to do in the Christian life is to suffer like Jesus. Peter doesn't downplay how bad our bad bosses and unjust masters can be. In fact, the, the word for master in verse 18 uh, is the Greek New Testament word despotes, uh, which is where we get the English word despot. Uh, when your boss is acting like a despot, treating you unfairly, treating you unjustly, making you suffer, Peter says, trace your life after the life of Jesus. Bosses are unfair. Uh, bad bosses. Bad bosses are unfair. They take credit for your work. They uh, blame you for their mistakes. Uh, they lash out at you for no good reason. They act entitled to your loyalty and to your affection. They show you little to no respect. They violate your boundaries. They use you and they manipulate you with flattery and false promises and threats. It's not easy to work under a bad boss or an unjust master, but there is no other way to suffer well. Look at what Peter says in verse 20. Peter says, what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. When we think the worst thing about work, uh, we think that the worst thing about working in a bad job is that it's unfair. But unfair suffering is actually the best kind of suffering 
because that's the only time you can suffer well. You can't suffer well when you deserve it. You can't suffer well for your own sins and mistakes. If you fail a test that you didn't study for, and we talked about a scenario like this in the youth group last Sunday, if you fail a test that you didn't study for, then you deserve to suffer. If you get caught in a lie, you deserve to suffer. If you're mean to your friends and your friends distance themselves from you, then you deserve to suffer. If you get caught stealing and go to jail, you deserve to suffer. The best thing that can come out of, of suffering that you deserve is repentance, which means that you admit that you deserve to suffer and you ask for forgiveness. But when you suffer unjustly, when you suffer for no good reason, or even better, when you suffer for doing something good, then you can really suffer well. Look at Jesus. Look at what Peter says in verses 23 and through 24 about Jesus. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Sometimes suffering is unfair and unjust, but it's okay if you have a perfect judge in heaven looking out for you. A, a perfect judge that you can trust. That's what enabled Jesus to suffer well. And it's the pattern that he's given to us to follow. We don't need to try to take justice into our own hands. We don't need to revile the people who revile us. We don't need to threaten the people who threaten us. We can serve people well, even in unfair and sometimes unbearable situations because service, true service is a gift of grace. That's what Peter says in verses 19 and 20. Peter says our service is a grace. He says, for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Verse 19. Then again in verse 20, he says, when we suffer for doing good to our masters, it is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Grace is an unconditional gift. It's, it's a gift that is not, that, that can never be forced. It's a gift that is undeserved. It can't be earned. It's a gift that is often some actually demerited. Uh, it's a gift, not something, not, it's not a reward, it's a gift. And so ironically, you can't actually serve anyone if you feel like a slave. The only way to truly serve someone is if you are emotionally rich, when you are absolutely free. You need to feel like you have enough to spare. You need to feel like you are free to do anything. Service is a form of free generosity. See, Peter doesn't even address the masters in this passage, uh, which really distinguishes him from Paul. Paul has similar passages in Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians 4, where he talks to slaves. But in both those passages, Paul talks also to masters, but Peter doesn't even address the masters. Because he wants us to understand that slaves who serve out of their freedom as a gift of God's grace have the higher calling than their masters do. Now, some of you may be thinking here, I don't think that's my calling. I, I, I think I'm I, I, I think God's calling me to be a master. I think I think that would be my spiritual gift. I have the spiritual gift of authority, right? This brings us to our third point. Jesus is trustworthy. The reason we can embrace the high call to serve is because we can trust Jesus. You see, Jesus is more than just an example for us to follow. He is our Savior. Peter makes a subtle but important shift in verse 24. Up to this point, he's been speaking in the second person. In verse 18, he says, be subject to your masters. In verse 21, he says, for this you have been called. 
Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. Then suddenly in verse 24, Peter shifts to the first person. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, uh, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Peter goes from telling people that they need Jesus to telling himself that he needs Jesus. He goes from teaching others about Jesus to worshiping Jesus together with others. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 is one of the most beautiful scriptures about the death of Christ in the entire Bible. If you haven't already, it's worth committing to memory. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Peter's describing how Jesus died on the cross. When Romans crucified someone, they stripped them naked and impaled them to a cross. These crosses would be lined up on highways or displayed up on hills as a warning to anyone who thought about opposing the Roman Empire. Crucifixion was both excruciating and humiliating. It normally took days for crucified people to die. They would literally waste away on the cross as they so slowly suffocated under their body weight uh, and as birds fed on their living flesh. Places where people were crucified had a pervasive stench. Uh, one hill just outside of Rome called Esquiline Hill uh, was a place dedicated to the crucifixion of slaves. When wealthy investors decided to gentrify the area, they picked out Esquiline Hill to build the world's first heated swimming pool. But what they didn't realize that it was how difficult it would be to get rid of the stench. There was a horrific stench on that hill from all the crucifixions that had been held there, from all the people who had died there. And then when they finally got rid of the stench, importing exotic plants with strong perfumes to hide the stench of crucifixion, uh, they and, and after they finished the project and built this, the world's first heated swimming pool, vultures still flocked around this hill for decades. There are very few descriptions of crucifixion in ancient literature. In fact, uh, some historians, at, one historian uh, actually says uh, that it's remarkable that we have any ancient accounts of crucifixions. Very few people wrote about crucifixion in the ancient world because very few people wanted to read about crucifixion in the ancient world. Uh, I don't want to read about crucifixion. I've, I've read about it to understand the Bible, and some of you are probably feeling really uncomfortable right now by the detail that I'm going into to describe what crucifixion actually is. Most of us have not read books about the electric chair or the process of lethal injection, and those forms of execution are tame and sanitary compared with crucifixion. It's incredible, then, that in the Bible we have four separate accounts of the crucifixion written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They each describe the crucifixion of one person. There are three people being crucified, but the focus is on one person, Jesus. Because this crucifixion was unlike any other crucifixion before. It was the only crucifixion of a truly and completely innocent and righteous human being. He committed no sin, Peter tells us. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. Jesus didn't just suffer and die for his own sins. He endured suffering for doing good. He himself bore our sins on in his body on the tree. He bore our sin. That was the only reason why he died. Jesus wasn't a slave. He wasn't a criminal. He wasn't a rebel. He died as our Savior. He died to redeem us from our sins. We may face injustice in this life, but that doesn't mean that we are innocent. 
we all have an unbearable weight of sin in our lives. Our sin is an unspeakable stench to God. But instead of turning away from us, God turned toward us in Jesus. He bore our sins on in his body on the cross, his body on the tree. That means we can die to sin and live to righteousness. Sin has no authority over us anymore. We're free. We're free to serve God. We're free to serve even our bad bosses. We don't, when we suffer for doing good, we don't need to get mad. We don't need to get bitter. We don't need to get even. We can endure justice, injustice because we know that Jesus endured the cross for us. This past Wednesday, Senegal kicked off uh, its COVID-19 vaccination campaign. People dressed in bright, colorful clothes and traditional robes. And one man uh, said it was with a feeling of immense joy that we welcomed the vaccine. We are fully confident about it, knowing it won't kill us. A doctor said, we have seen how COVID manifests itself. And so it was with a smile that we can get vaccinated and at last achieve immunity. And, you know, it's, it's such a beautiful story of the joy of vaccination. And I know that I've experienced a little bit of that joy vicariously when I, whenever I hear about people in our church family, frontline workers who are getting vaccinated, it makes me really happy inside to know that you're safe. Peter finishes up today's passage by quoting Isaiah 53. And he writes, by his wounds, you have been healed. There is healing in Jesus' wounds. His death, his resurrection has 100% efficacy. It is the cure for your sin and your brokenness and all the sin and brokenness of this world. His death and resurrection have 100% efficacy. His wounds are the perfect vaccine. You may have hardship in this life. You may even suffer for doing good. But none of these things can kill you. We don't understand exactly how. But the wounds of Jesus will heal you. You have a cure. The cure in Jesus, the shepherd and overseer of your soul. That means if Jesus is your savior, your job doesn't have to make you or break you. You don't need to worry about getting ahead in your career. You don't need to be devastated when you're treated unfairly. You don't need to feel worthless when people are harsh with you. Just focus on doing a good job. Just focus on serving others. Serve well as a gift of grace. Do your work with reverence for Jesus. He is the cure. Your job is not the cure. You can trust Jesus. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Don't be afraid of where you stand in your job. Trace your life to the one who loves you and gave himself for you because there is no higher calling in all the world. Let's pray. Father, as we reflect on this passage, um, we're blown away uh, by the high calling that you've given us and blown away even more by the high calling you fulfilled for us in Jesus the high cost of our redemption. God, we thank you that however you might call us to serve, we will never be able to outserve Jesus. And God, we, we thank you, Lord, that we are able to serve such a worthy master, not a master who is unjust or unfair or harsh with us, but a master who loves us and who will reward us, not with justice, but with grace. God, we thank you that our cups all overflow in the blessings that f flow from the cross where Jesus died to save us. 
And so God, we pray that you would make our hearts full. We pray that whatever fears or anxieties about our work, about the future that we might carry with us, that these things would fade away, that they would diminish, and that you would help us, Lord, to, to, to fear and revere Jesus, our faithful master who loves us and gave himself for us. And we pray that this would change us and transform us in such a way that we might suffer well, tracing our lives after his, all that he would be magnified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the time in the worship service where we would normally collect our tithes and offering. And even though we can't collect that physically, you can still give to the ministry of our church at our website, newlifefremont.org slash give. You'll find a link to our PayPal if you want to give electronically, as well as our mailing address if you wanted to mail a check. I also want to highlight our CARE Fund. If you want to make an additional donation to our CARE Fund, that money will go toward people in our congregation who have extra financial needs during this pandemic. If you want to give a donation, just comment on the PayPal and mention the CARE Fund or on the memo line of your check, right? That is for the CARE Fund. But with that said, let's continue worship now and sing our final song together. Sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silence as He stood.
Well, as always, the final words of our worship service are the Lord's blessing to you. So I invite you to stretch out your hands and receive the Lord's benediction, which comes from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. We'll see you next week. <laughs>